Tamil Briggs. He's a director of the Diplomatic Academy in Vienna. He's a diplomat. Uh, he's an Aust Austrian diplomat and historian. Uh, starting in 1982, he worked for the Foreign uh, Service of the Republic of Austria. He was a secretary in the Austrian Parliament uh, for the Parliamentary Group uh, of the People's Party. Uh, he was the Austrian ambassador in London and Moscow. And uh, he's also representative chairman of the Institute for the Danube Region and Central Euro Europe. He became the director of the Diplomatische Akademie Wien uh, in Vienna. Uh, uh, in 2017. Uh, so, Professor Briggs, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for being with us and talking about this exciting topic. Good morning from my side also. Thank you for the invitation. Um, uh, it's an exciting topic. Uh, I say, first of all, thank you that the organizers are finishing uh, the, the summer school with the education issue which is the most fundamental of all the issues that we are discussing. And I'm also happy to say that the organizers are um, bringing it in a connection with political issues and economic issues, which unfortunately in our discussions normally about higher education reform are not, they are not really addressed properly, especially in the European Union. So that's one of the points already I would like to make. Uh, from my background, uh, you may uh, understand that I have lived in different worlds. I was politically responsible for the Austrian Ministry of Science when I was head of cabinet of a minister. Then I was working as a diplomat with practical issues of how we can cooperate uh, also in educational issues. Uh, and now I'm working in, as a as director of a, of a university, of a small uh, postgraduate university. And that's already uh, uh, I got the very strong feeling that higher education has become a very insular world. It's a very insular world which is not really integrated into the proper changes and transformations we are experiencing. Uh, we can discuss all the reasons. Uh, one of the very obvious uh, consequences is all these discussions about um, creating in universities safe spaces, like the American universities are still in this process of creating safe spaces where some issues cannot be discussed from different perspectives or angles. This is one of the symptoms of the consequences of that higher education has become a very insular world. Uh, there are certainly also attempts to make change to this. Uh, and unfortunately, I have to say, uh, the main idea that we, at least in Europe we came up with is putting stress on what is called the third mission. The third mission. I'm sorry to say so, but uh, nobody outside of the university world has any idea what third mission might mean. They might think it's going to the moon or to the Mars uh, with people. Actually, uh, it's already that this sort of title that, that we have found uh, to discuss a very simple problem that we have. That the problem is transmission from the academic world to general public, uh, to the discussions of how societies are changing. This is the third mission. Uh, and I would say it is very obvious that uh, a, a university in the, in the, in, in the, for the future has to put a stress on this transmission function. I propose that we find a different title uh, for this uh, for than, than, than third mission. Um, we know uh, this uh, is especially important where the transformation of society is important. And there, where I think our region, the Central European region, has a specific task in hand, uh, because it's not simply uh, continuing in the field, in, 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 in liberal democracy that has been has been developing over at least the time uh, after the Second World War, but there is this sort of coming to understand, analyze, and transmit the transformation issues uh, with academic means, with research, and with teaching. Uh, in our Central European region in a different way uh, to make sense of what is happening uh, around us. So my, third my first point is already the transmitting knowledge into society uh, uh, is certainly the most urgent task 
uh, of education for the future. Uh, and this would help us also in this, uh, what I called that higher education is a, is, is a very insular world. My second point <clears throat> is about how can we make uh, the education managers and education experts in, in, in Europe aware that the geopolitical and geoeconomic transformations mean also that we have to think about the structure how our universities work and how our academic world works. Uh, let me expand a little bit on this. Uh, we are very proud, many of us are very proud that we have implemented the Bologna system. Many of us are very proud that we finally have a meritocratic, so-called meritocratic system of university rankings. We all know there are various university, international university rankings. Uh, we are very proud that we have this peer review publication system that allows us to, uh, to make quality control in our academic world. But maybe we should ask ourselves whether these geopolitical transformations uh, uh, are a, uh, a very clear indication uh, of the problems of these uh, three elements I mentioned, Bologna, ranking system and peer review. Uh, and I would uh, really say the education for the future uh, has to make changes here. Uh, we know that the Bologna system uh, is actually saying we want to increase mobility. And it's not proven that it has really improved uh, the mobility of, 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 of young people. Uh, and secondly, it meant making things comparable. That was the consequence. And making things comparable it is not very helpful if, we, if you are dealing with uh, transformation and if you are dealing uh, with uh, uh, plurality, uh, diversity uh, in the given situation. Uh, so there is, a, as I see it, a contradiction between the Bologna system asking for uh, comparability uh, and, and thus creating chances for mobility uh, and the idea that in order to understand the modern society, we need to, uh, to deal with diversity and deal with, uh, with plurality. Uh, and the second consequence of the Bologna system, uh, as we all know, is or the objective of the Bologna system uh, is to have more and more academics. Uh, again, it might be for, for, for some societies a, a good thing that you create the rate of academics. Uh, if you have the labor market for that, uh, but uh, you increase the pressure uh, on other forms of education, which I'm not sure this is the right system. Do we really want to achieve that? I don't know. Fifty percent of our of our of our of our young people uh, have an academic uh, education. Uh, I, I'm not sure about that, but this is a is, is a real objective. Um, uh, I would rather say we should invest uh, in the quality and the appreciation of also of other forms of education, uh, which are uh, something like which are, ha have to do with uh, uh, with uh, um, um, manual work. I have to say manual work or technical work outside of, of our universities. Uh, so uh, there is a, an obvious problem uh, with, with this sort of thing. Uh, and you know what's behind that, and that I would challenge. Behind the idea that uh, we have the Bologna system and the re peer review process and the ranking systems is the idea that better education makes societies more open-minded and de more democratic. We have to look into this issue. Does better education really make societies more open-minded and more democratic? I hope yes. The studies are not so outspoken about this. And what do, we, what do we mean by better education? If we simply mean bringing more people into uh, post-secondary uh, education systems, we are like trade unions for the existing universities. And I don't think that if you want to improve our system of education, we should become trade unionists for, uh, for the existing university system and the existing academic world. We have to challenge it. But how do we come outside of this box is, is one of the, uh, of the, of, of the main issues. Uh, and my, my already final point, I shouldn't be too long, is a, uh, I think a rather complica complicated one. 
um, are we different in Central Europe? Do we have something to offer for the education system of the world? Do we have something to offer which is uh, which is not maybe not unique, but which is which is helpful? Uh, and my impression is from my contact and knowledge of the U.S. education system, higher education system, is yes. Uh, I organized in Vienna two weeks ago a conference about comparing uh, European and US uh, uh, transatlantic relations, how also in the field of, of, of higher education, we can recharge the transatlantic relations. So not only recharge it with NATO and the political side, but also in the education world. And I was very surprised by the US professors uh, who proposed uh, that we should look, we should understand in Central Europe that we have become interesting for the US uh, higher education system again. That more and more young researchers are looking into the diversity of, of Central Europe uh, in the late 19th and the whole 20th and the 20th century. So this how uh, we dealt with in our area, and we still have to deal with that, uh, with minorities with diversity, with plurality, has become uh, interesting for the American society. Why? That's very obvious because of the polarization that's happening in the US society at the moment uh, and the uh, overextension of, of, of the issue of identity politics, uh, certainly also in the US context. And this is not only a US uh, a problem, but I think this is a global issue where possibly some of these traditions and experiences uh, of, of Central Europe, how to uh, live in times of identity politics and how to accommodate plurality can be helpful. So there is a, a new US interest in Habsburg studies, which is interesting. Uh, and I think our Central European uh, contribution to education for the future could be uh, uh, recharge uh, Habsburg studies and what it meant for our nations, states, uh, and societies, minorities, and so on. So there's a lot of, of, of issues uh, which is in there. Uh, and the, 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 the background of this is actually, uh, and this is to my mind also an experience which we had to go through in Central Europe more than other parts of the world, uh, is the issue uh, how do we work with the humanities, the crisis of humanities in the academic world? Uh, it's interesting to see that all our politicians are all the time talking about technology, engineering, they're talking about the so-called, what we call the mint subjects, so mathematics and, and all these sort of subjects, uh, uh, and humanities somehow become, well, they become flowers, nice, very colorful flowers somewhere uh, in the at, the at the edges of the academic world. Uh, and uh, the only thing that, that counts is maybe future research or uh, some sort of, uh, of philosophy, uh, but all uh, somehow in a very insular world, as I said at the very beginning. So how can we recharge humanities? Uh, and I think when we look again in the Central European experience, uh, it has to do a lot with the relevance of humanities. Uh, and uh, I think Ferenc Mischlewitz uh, and, and his colleagues who were active as, as, as young people uh, in the dissident movements of the late 80s uh, uh, understand what I'm talking about. Because it, in, in countries like Hungary, Poland and other countries, uh, it was people who came from the side of humanities uh, who could suddenly uh, work with, as in the Polish case, uh, with trade unions, with workers uh, on, on changing societies. Uh, it was not the mathematicians because of mathematics or the uh, or the, the technology people who made the changes. So maybe we should not uh, always look at Silicon Valley and how we can get this technology from there, but, but we should create something like a humanity Silicon Valley, which we had actually in the Central European area. So I hope my, my three points were not too radical, but I thought for, for the beginning of our discussion, uh, it's worth uh, not talking about the small nails that we have to put in. Uh, I always follow the Austrian psychologist Paul Watzlawick, who said, uh, if you are a hammer, uh, all your problems look like nails. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>